Talk about what's happened fundamentally and then why you think sentiment has turned so weak in the last couple of quarters. I mean, I think the fundamentals in the industry, at least in the United States, are only improving. Quarter on quarter, we're seeing substantial growth in all the major companies. Some companies that are a little further behind their development, so they're still losing money. Cureleaf has now turned the corner. It's our second quarter of positive EBITDA growth and our first quarter of positive cash flow. So we think we've turned the corner. I think you're going to see uh, in the fourth and the first quarter probably a move towards positive net income as well. And we're still growing at around 300 percent a year. So we're still seeing substantial growth. Um, as far as the stock prices, I think that what you're seeing is, is that Canada has not performed as well. Uh, we're seeing, uh, but I think there's structural problems in the Canadian market which need to be resolved. Eventually, Canada will turn the corner. I think it's just going to take a bit longer. And because cannabis stocks are much wider invested in, uh, it has a larger audience because it's legal federally, and so anyone can invest in Canadian stocks, whereas the audience that can invest in U.S. stocks is limited. And so, therefore, we've seen the U.S. stocks sort of go along with Canadian stocks, even though U.S. results are far better. When you talk about the structural, structural problems in, in Canada, how much of that is regulatory? And if so, what does that mean in terms of lessons that could be learned as we see it continue to be legalized by states here in the U.S.? So it is regulatory for the most part. So in Canada, you have two problems. The first problem is, is that you have the federal government controls the sales points uh, for cannabis, and they actually do the ordering of, of cannabis into their stores. And because they didn't roll out the stores fast enough, you don't have as high demand coming into the stores as you would. Secondly, you don't have the products. So if in the United States, we basically have all products from flour in its natural form all the way to edibles, vapes, um, uh, um, different kinds of, of lotions and, and things like that. So you have a, just a very different product mix. So Canada doesn't have the products and it has a government that's controlling the distribution. What should investors know about Florida as a market that, that's important for your space? I mean, you got more than a, a quarter million registered patients, uh, I believe, there. You had a bit of a supply shortage in October, but things are looking better there. You're really building up a big presence in that market. How much is it a bellwether? Listen, Florida and California are the, definitely the two biggest markets today in the United States. New York, if it changes some of its rule, will probably be the third biggest state. Florida is an important part of our business. Um, in every market that we operate as purely, we're either number one, number two. We are behind in Florida. We're the number two operator there. And not only is there 250,000 patients, but you understand there's a backlog of 120,000 that are trying to get their cards. The state just can't move fast enough to register. So it's a very important state. We expect it to be over 400,000 patients at the end of next year, just to show you the kind of growth we're seeing. And there's five of the top companies are all present there. So I think that you're going to see more and more companies doing well on the back of Florida. Meantime, Caroleaf is headquartered in Massachusetts. You got lawmakers there voting today on a bill to ban flavored tobacco. We've seen we've seen it basically become ground zero for a lot of every, a lot of the stuff that's going on with vaping right now. That has extended to a certain extent to medical marijuana vaping too. How has that affected the company, and what do you expect to play out there? So I think you have to differentiate between tobacco flavored vaping and cannabis vaping. Yeah. Tobacco flavored vaping really is an issue of our children in the United States, our, our, our teenagers who are getting hooked on, on very high doses of nicotine. And they are, to be honest, I'm very supportive of that issue. With medical cannabis, you don't really have the same uh, vaping uh, flavor problem. The problem yeah. in, in, in THC cannabis was the vitamin E. And I think we've now seen, even the CDC came out and said that was a vitamin E problem. And if you look at most of the tests that were done, none of the regulated stores or the regulated product had vitamin E in them. So it really is a black market issue. And we actually see that as a positive because what will happen is people will start to migrate from the black market to the regulated market in order to get safe products. Is that going to happen on its own or do regulators need to press on the black market even more? I mean, our opinion is regulators need to press on the black market. The whole idea behind legalization is move the product out of the black market. I mean, you guys probably remember, you know, uh, gin and, and during the prohibition period where people were going blind. This is the same thing. You have black market products that are totally unregulated and people are buying them thinking they are regulated. Well, they're not. And so if you buy from a regulated store in the state, you're not going to get that kind of a product. Yeah.